Okay, Dr. Turner, welcome to the show. For anybody that doesn't know you and isn't aware of your work, can you tell us a bit about your background and how you got into, into the work that you're currently doing? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, I've been a psychotherapist for around, what are we now, since 2022, so about 18 years since I qualified um, and so on. And I started training back in 2000 at a place called the Centre for Counseling Psychotherapy Education in West London, uh, which is an integrative transpersonal training course. And I was really just there to do some personal work on myself and to develop my own sort of, you know, understand who I was. Um, because I was enjoying the work so much, I decided to stay and become a psychotherapist. And I've been here ever since doing bits of teaching and lecturing and, and working as a supervisor along the way. Um, where I am now is I work part-time in private practice a couple of days a week, but I'm also the course leader for a course in humanistic counseling and psychotherapy at the University of Brighton in East Sussex. Uh, where I teach um, on a postgraduate diploma course a couple of days a week, just bringing in the next generation of counselors and psychotherapists and so on. And alongside that, I do a fair amount of writing. I'm yeah, a great blogger, for example. I like to write blogs and so on. Um, I've also written papers for uh, for journals uh, and for for um, books as well, uh, collections of, or, or anthologies, that's a good word. But I suppose at the moment, one of the things I'm most I'm known for is writing a book called Intersections of Privilege and Otherness in Counseling Psychotherapy, currently published by Routledge, and it's been out there and for what, about over 18 months now. It's been doing fairly well in the field of counseling and psychotherapy. It brings like an intersectional focus onto ideas of identity and looks at how these are um, constructed uh, and just what privilege and otherness actually is uh, in, in the world today. Really interesting. So what initially sparked your interest in intersectionality, privilege, and, and otherness? Sure. Well, that came out of my doctoral work, which I started in about 2012 at the University of Northampton. And the actual, the original idea was to look at, um, to try to understand the internalized or unconscious experience of being the other, being the outsider. Uh, and what I did is I drew up a, a project whereby I interviewed 25 people about their experience of being a, a marginalized in some way. And then using creative works, such as visualization, drawings, um, meditation, and sound play work, look to look at different ways of externalizing those internalized experiences using creativity. But one of the things I realized along the way was if I'm going to try and understand varying experiences of being the outsider, what I also need to do is understand how identity is formed. And that's why I started to come across ideas about intersectionality, because they made the most sense. You know, we don't lead single issue life. You know, I'm not just a man, I'm not just a person of color. I'm very multifaceted, as you are, as anybody else who's listening to this, this cast will, will be as well. But understanding how those varying parts of our identities sort of fit in together and where we either hold privilege or otherness, that was something I had to develop as part of my project. So that's where the intersectional, intersectional approach became quite useful for myself in trying to understand just what it is to be um, a multifaceted human being. So we're all very complex. Really interesting. So... I think I think now would be a good time just to maybe clarify our definition of inter intersectionality, and also to ask, you know, um, why is this important for people working in the in the therapeutic professions to understand intersectionality? Do you think? Sure. Well, as for, for a definition, um, as I already started to, started to say, it, in a way, we don't lead single issue lives. It's something that, that Audrey Lord uh, talked about in some of her writings around around the topic area, and it's a term that was used very much by Kimberly Crenshaw, Richard Hills Collins, and other sort of black feminists. From the United States, who 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 built on sort of some sort of uh, mainstream feminist ideas about marginalization, their idea was that actually persons of color uh, walk with a very different experience of being marginalized than those of their sort of white counterparts, and they needed a different language to talk about this experience. What they also realized was that actually sometimes different aspects of their identity were clashing together, and the legal framework of the time didn't really recognize that actually people could, could, could be marginalized for more than one facet of their identity at any given moment in time. So they came up with the idea of intersectionality. And the rest of the question, in, in, in a way. <laughs> I was just around, why is this important for mental health professionals to be aware of? Sure. Well, the thing about um, the work that we do as, as mental health professionals is, is we, 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 we were, the danger with the work that we actually do is we were prone to stereotyping. And one of the things we, when, what happens when, when we stereotype is we forget that a person is a, a mass of different identities all merged into one human being. And when we stereotype, we actually mark, we, we reduce them down to one or two key areas that makes it easier for us, if you like, to understand, inverted commas, or to oppress or marginalize that other, 
or to put them on a pedestal as having more privilege than us as well, because that can also happen as well. It's also something we can do to ourselves. And what an intentional approach actually starts to do is to give us the language and the framework to understand the complexity of human beings and their experiences. And if we were able to hold all of that, then we actually start to see the fullness of a human that's sat within us, with, with us in our consulting rooms, um, in our psychiatric places, whatever it might be, as opposed to, yeah. So, so as opposed to somebody just seeing me as a man, they'll see me as hopefully as, oh, they'll ask enough questions to find out that I'm, I'm, I'm a father, I'm a former husband, um, I'm an academic, other aspects that ma mark me out as way more than just one or two key areas. We give somebody back their humanity by remembering that actually they are complex beings. So it's really about recognizing the multifaceted nature of, of every human being we and not just reducing them to one category and then basing everything that we're doing in therapy based on that one category. It's they're multifaceted, multi-identity. Exactly. Exactly right. Um, okay. So w whenever we're talking about intersectionality, there's a, there's a moral aspect to this as well. And mm -hmm. could you maybe tell us about the life and work of uh, a lady called Sylvia Pankhurst and why, why that's important? Sure. I, um, Sylvia Pankhurst was the daughter of Emmeline Pankhurst, the famous feminist um, and activist who was one of the was a fight for women's rights about 100 years ago um, or so. And one of the wonderful things about um, the Pankhursts is in winning their fight for, for women's rights in, in this country, they set in motion something which was you know, unprecedented at, at the time. You know, these are people who were marginalized, who were often locked up and incarcerated for, time, for periods of time. Um, and so on. they suffered an awful lot along the way. They were activists in their own time. The wonderful thing about Sylvia Pankhurst, though, and the interesting thing about her story was she fell out with her own mother and sister because she recognized that actually the fight for rights was not just one around based around women's rights, but was also based around the rights of other minority groups of that period of time. Now, something like, you know, one of the stories that, that a couple of stories that always jump out for me was um, she worked really hard using her own privilege as a white middle class woman, I guess, to fight for workers' rights in that sort of early part of the last century where the Industrial Revolution had really taken a hold. So much so that it was often the unions of the time and so on who would. Um, pay the fines and raise money to actually have her released from prison after she'd been incarcerated under the uh, the cat and mouse laws of the time, which I recommend people look up. With a caveat, it's kind of grim reading for that sort of route. She was also the sort of woman who used her privilege as well to petition the British government to uh, have a number of the dissidents and activists in the former Soviet Union brought to this country before Stalin's purges really took a hold, and many of whom didn't make it in time and all that sort of stuff. Um, and one of my favorite stories from her, her life was that actually she, she worked especially hard to have Haile Selassie, the former emperor of Ethiopia, brought to this country where he, re he resided in Wimbledon in London, of all, of all places, under exile, uh, whilst Mussolini's fascists raided and invaded uh, Ethiopia. And one of the things about Sylvia Pankhurst is not to, to say that she invented intersectional sort of approaches to, 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 uh, to understanding difference, but to echo your sort of question, there's a she recognizes a moral imperative to work not just for her own grouping, but to work for other groups, to use her own privilege to actually help other people along the way. And it's, that's incredibly key to understand the intersectional approach. Often in the environments we work within, you know, many people I work with, students or whatever else, they have a a um a civil justice or social justice sort of element to them. The intersectional approach actually says you can have that that's fine but don't forget there are other groups that might need your support and allyship along the way so that's why i think it's actually quite important to recognize the moral aspect of that really interesting so something that really jumped out at me from a theme from your talk at the weekend university was mm. this idea that, you know that privilege isn't inherently a bad thing mm. everybody's got layers of privilege well yeah. not everybody but a lot of people yeah. do mm. and it's only, you know, it can be a good thing if it's put to use in the service of others, other mm. groups outside of your own, you know, and mm -hmm. can you expand upon that there? And also, mm. um, the other thing I want to ask a follow up on that, when does privilege become a bad thing? When does it become toxic, would you say? I think, you know, I'm going to ask that, that second part, first of all, for myself, when privilege starts to become toxic, it's when we reject or forget 
or you know, our, our responsibility to the other, to each other in, in some way. Um, maybe some out of some sort of narcissism or, or selfishness, we decide to put ourselves first and actually forget that there are other people who might need our support in some ways. Like that's when things start to then become quite difficult. But, um, we're all in this together, but in a culture such as our own here in the global north, that can feel a bit um, woo or woke or whatever it is that we actually have, we interact with each other, we need to support each other in some sort of way. We never very much in a culture which is uh, quite individualistic where it's all about making sure that we get what we have in order to, for, for oneself to survive. The perfect example of that came out of, um, yeah, what I love about having done presentation with yourself, it was during lockdowns. And during that very first lockdown in 2020, when people were just raiding the shelves of shops and taking all the toilet roll and the pasta and whatever else, there was an element of selfishness that went with some of that. Yeah, I'm gonna hoard as much as I possibly can do, as much as I'm okay, or my family are okay. And on one level, it makes sense. There's a survival instinct that gets triggered in that. On another level, there's an element of selfishness about, well, you're going to take too much. What about the others that might need what you've got that you then end up throwing away several months down the line, that sort of thing. So that's when it becomes a bit more toxic. We actually, we, we put ourselves front and center out of some sort of survival instinct and we forget that we actually have a responsibility to others. But what I also said, and I think it comes to your, the first part of your, uh, of your question, privilege is not a bad thing. If we're born with different varying aspects of our identity, then some of those will have benefits. They're not all going to mark us out as an, as an outsider. Um, I wasn't born an academic, but I've walked, I'm an academic now. So getting to sit and talk to yourself is me using my privilege to the benefit of, of the Wigan University and anyone who is watching this sort of this talk today, which I think is actually really quite useful and, and helpful for everybody involved. And these things, they don't stay static either. They actually ebb and flow given whatever the time of life we're in and so on. You know, we live in a culture where youth is very much valorized, for example. So what am I, I'm 53 at the time of, of this recording. So therefore my my time of, of being, of, of the privilege of, of owning the privilege of youth, that's long gone in my case. So I've had to go move into different areas of, 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 my, of my life and my career. Um, so it, these things don't stay static either. They do change over time. And these are, this is quite important to recognize. 100%. I think the, the quote I really liked that you used in the talk was uh, from Indiana Jones. It's not the years, it's the mileage or something like that. There. <laughs> yes. And that we can come back and haunt me at some point. <laughs> Shows my geekiness in there somewhere. But yeah, it's a great quote. Um, so has, you know, we're talking here about, you know, otherness and being othered. You know, and you, I'd be curious to ask if, you, if you don't mind. You know, sure. are there any been any examples in your own life where you've had that experience of being othered, um, in your in your work, or can you tell give us? Well, a in my in my personal world, of course, of course, as a as a man of color living in in, in a majority white sort of environment, I've been othered all the time. Um, to offer up some some you know simple examples that the, I think one it, it's I'm trying to give a specific example in, in a way, um. The thing about other, I've often, one of the things that I can often be told, and it came up a lot when I first started to talk about all this sort of material, was that I was being a bit too too loud. I should I should know my place. I should keep quiet. I shouldn't speak up about difference and so on. Um, and one or two people were actually quite vociferous about about their objections to what I what I had to say. Um, and there was an element of well, you're just being the, the, the loud black man, or them feeling quite afraid. That, Based around some idea that I was horribly angry or whatever, it, whatever it was, and it wasn't that I was angry. I was just, I was just speaking up. Mm. And I think othering is a, it's a very complex sort of, sort of, sort of topic. So it, it's either coming from the outside, or what we can actually do is do it to ourselves. That's the other part to it. But I think in speaking up, there was also a recognition that I'd othered myself prior to that. Um, I remember around the time that George Floyd was murdered feeling that I, I didn't know what to say and couldn't say it because I didn't have the voice to do so. Um, but then recognizing that actually what had happened was in being, I, I othered myself beforehand and, and his murder had raised within myself the, uh, the sadness, the pain of being marginalized by society and therefore having to speak about it. So putting myself back together and finding my voice to speak out in, in a way. I know it's a, it's a slightly convoluted answer to what you're what you're asking, but it sort of speaks to othering. It's a comp. It's, it's something which we can which we can all endure at any given moment in time. Um, other examples. 
the idea that I might or might not be able to bring the fullness of my, my, I don't know, my black identity to work or take it out into the world in some way because of what, how that might be perceived is a form of othering, both self and that comes in from the outside as well. Um, you know, as you know, I'm sure there'll be women who, for example, be watching this, will, they'll be saying, yeah, I'd be asking them, can, do you feel you can bring the fullness of your identity to the workplace or are certain aspects of yourself not allowed or put, or you've been told to put them to one side, like I don't, whatever it might be for that individual. We're never really allowed to be our full, our full self in our social constructive realities. 100%, 100%. And have you thought much about why there is such an imbalance in the psychotherapeutic profession when it comes to, to race? Oh, great question. Have I thought why? Well, there are a number of answers to that one. Um, there's a socioeconomic one. It's expensive to train as a counselor like a, a counselor or a psychotherapist. It doesn't matter where you go. You're talking tens of thousands of pounds to get through a two-year postgraduate diploma course, or if you go somewhere that's a four-year master's or whatever else, that's a lot of money to have to find, which therefore limits a, a good number of the, of the population of, of, of the UK, for example, from accessing the trainings. Um, I think the lack of bursaries is another one, because um, I think that the more that, that governing bodies put in place bursaries to, to actually facilitate the entrance points for different minorities, not just around race, um, the more likely it is that we'll be able to start to level up, and I can't stand that phrase, our profession a bit, a bit more. Mm. There are also elements of safety, I think, if I go into the courses themselves. Something I've come across a lot more over the past couple of years in discussing with courses what they're what they're actually doing around difference and diversity. How safe it is it for their minorities, just the racialized ones, to actually bring themselves to the room without feeling that um, they're being stereotyped by the facilitators, or they're running into the problems with, with their peers in some way. So I think those, those those are some of the difficulties, and there are many others as well that come into play around this. Okay. Okay. Um... Now, now I want to get in maybe to start talking about, you know, the influence of our early life experiences and our early attachments in how we experience difference in the world. You know, can you maybe tell us a bit more about that there? Sure. It, some of this comes out of the work of two particular authors. There's Jean Piaget, the contemporary of Sigmund Freud, who was writing uh, 100 years ago, really, um, around how prejudice it's necessary for us in order to form our, I'm going to put this word in, socially constructed parts of our identity. Um, so what that basically means is, is, is that kids basically, they don't, well, a simple way of putting it, putting it is this. Children don't marginalise and form groups around the protective characteristics of the 2012 Equalities Act. Anyone who's been around a child would have, would have seen them actually form their own in and out groups based around whatever they perceive as um, acceptable or not acceptable. Maybe, they're, you know, maybe they're, they are of a certain, I don't know, colour or shade and somebody else is not, and they'll, they'll mark them out as not being acceptable. Or the other kid is like too small, too big, too whatever it might be. They're maybe a bit straight. Apparently, all these things then can lead a child to feel like they're being, that, 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 that their identity is being threatened in some way, so they'll actually marginalise that other. So prejudice from a very early age form, helps the child form a sense of who they actually are. We all have them. If we didn't have them, we, would be, we wouldn't know much about ourselves. The second theorist I always like to mention is um, a, a woman called Frances Abood, who wrote a great book back in the 1980s called Children and Prejudice, where she took this a, a, a lot further. And she explored um, material around the, diff the varying stages that children go through in moving from that sort of more narcissistic, it's all about themselves stage of development, so, which is more socio-relational, whereby actually they'll start to relate to the other and their own sort of internalized feelings about their own difference um, in a more amenable and helpful way. Um, actually, did a, lot of, a lot of research around it from what I, what, what I understand. Um, and some of the things I talk about in this sort of stage of any sort of presentation, I'm doing at the university or with yourselves, is I, I try and mark out that, actually, that, that actual movement from that sort of narcissistic stage that more, more egocentric stage where a child is very much about themselves and can't quite empathize with the other, even though they recognize that the other is there. The other is quite threatening in a way. So something which is more sociocentric, whereby they can empathize and put themselves in the um, position, uh, the imagined position of how that other might feel should something happen to them, if that, make, that makes sense. Um, you know, a friend of mine told me a story about one of their children whereby um, 
there was a child at, the, at, the, at their school who had, had some sort of learning difficult, developmental difficulty, and their child took it upon themselves to invite that child in to play games with their, their, their little crowd, um, which is a way of actually not being afraid of the other, but recognizing there's an other there who needs to be included and still they, they can be who they are, that makes sense. So yeah. children, they, there's that wonderful quote, um, children aren't born you know, racist or homophobic or whatever it is, they learn that over time. And in a way it's right, but in a way it's also wrong. One of the other things I will say about this as well is the role of parents and caregivers is hugely important because sometimes children get stuck at certain egocentric stages for their, to, to what the identity is because of the, the, the influence of, the, of those around them. Maybe the parents' racism has then led to that child internalizing that it's okay to marginalize somebody based upon their, their race and color. Um, and that's never actually challenged. And so sometimes caregivers have a huge role in how children manage that transition from A to B to C. Just a quick break here to tell you about an exciting new membership we're developing, and then we'll get right back to the show. This gets you access to our mastered library of over five years of psychology conferences, including over 230 talks and interviews with the world's leading psychologists, professors, and authors, unlimited CPD certification, transcripts, quizzes, premium passes for our annual conference, online courses with Richard Schwartz and Deb Dana, and more. The cost is £97 for one year, which breaks down at around 27p per day. The best bit is you can try it out for 30 days completely risk-free, as all orders come with a 100% money-back guarantee. If you're interested, please go to twumembers.com for more information. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, just talking about the role of parents and caregivers here, I think everybody's had the experience of of being othered and being the other. Yeah. And we've all yeah. had things, you know, I grew up a ginger yeah. in, North, in Northern Ireland with red hair. That was a, mm. that was one of my, another one was me. So I was diabetic as well. So I was always like ah. pricking my finger and that was a, mm. a socially a, not really a, a normal thing to be doing. Mm. But for some reason, I think it was my parents maybe planted beliefs in my head that like, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being diabetic. It's actually like a, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's something, it's a strength or whatever. So I always, I was never mm -hmm. ashamed of that. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what role mm -hmm. do you think the, the parents or caregivers can play in helping, helping their, their children to embrace otherness and mm -hmm. not always seeing it as a negative. Is, is there a place mm -hmm. for that? Oh, totally. I think you, you totally, and I love your example about your parents and, 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 and you know, you being, being diabetic and how normalizing your parents were around that. And often when children, are, when, when they are, when they do normalize it, it takes away some of the shame of being an outsider because a child obviously knows that actually what they're doing is, you know, or what, whatever the, the aspect is, it's, um, there's an element of society that may not appreciate or, 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 or accept it. That makes sense. It could be anything. But when children actually, so when parents actually start to say, well, actually, no, that's not quite quite right. This is just who you are. You are you're an individual and you're still loved for it. That it takes out some of the shame that might come from being marginalized by certain groups because one is seen as too short, too tall, having whatever sort of hairstyle or being, or, or being dark skin, whatever it might be. Um, so I think parents have a massive role in that. Being othered when it's unwitting and, or, you know, let's, move the word other to one side. When one experiences racism, homophobia, sexism, or whatever it happens to be, there's an element of shame that's passed on to one, oneself because that sense of one's outsiderness has been marked out as a flaw in some way. And that can be internalized as a sense, with a sense of shame. Um, in, in a way. And if, if that's not managed in some, in some sort of fashion, that can be really quite detrimental and change one of those sort of very odd emotions. It's very sort of, my phrase, my metaphorical phrase, it's a very sort of sticky emotion that we don't talk enough about because we're sort of ashamed of it to some degree. Um, but the more that we can recognize that actually these parts that mark us out as the other are strengths or are just normal, then it takes out some of that internalized shame that we've been we've uh, taken on board for whatever reason. A great example, colorism um, or shadism is another phrase, uh, way of, of putting that whereby lots of persons of color find it very difficult to acknowledge who they are as, as, as the, uh, the racialized other based upon their color, and will do whatever it is um, to either literally whiten the skin 
or to um, adapt mannerisms or whatever it might be that mark them out as more white than black. So that sense of shame that underpins that internalized racism can be a part of the experience of being a, of being another, being an outsider. Hundred percent. I I think there was a story you gave in your talk with us as well. You know, it was around your daughter at nursery and. Mm -hmm. She was marginalized for for her skin color. Maybe tell us about that and how you manage the situation so that it didn't become didn't become a, a long term problem. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, she was when I when I used to tell that story. Um, what happened was she was about three years old, and I live on the south coast of England, um, and they have you know a good number of, of, of nurseries down down this end. And one summer's day um, at the nursery, what you know, my my daughter was there playing with some of her friends. And what had happened was, I found out later on, is that a family had come down from London. And as can happen, what they sometimes do is they book a place in the nursery and leave their kids there in order to go off and have a bit of fun along the seafront and, and whatever else, so uh, get a bit of parental uh, help along the way. Now, a six-year-old girl had come into this, this, this nursery on that particular day. What had happened was, was she decided to set up a group whereby there were people playing games with her and marginalized my daughter and didn't want to play with my daughter, didn't want to help my daughter to join in. And my daughter said, well, why, you know, why is that? Why won't you let me play, play games with yourselves? And she said, and the six-year-old said, that's because your, your skin's too dirty and your hair's kind of ugly. My daughter, of course, came home in tears and upset, believing that she was ugly and her hair was awful and all those sorts of things. So she started to take on board what this six-year-old had told her. Now, of course, Myself and my former partner, we go off to the nursery and we talk to them about it, what, what, what's going on. And they take the party line of, well, we, we treat everybody the same. Um, we don't exclude it, whatever else. Totally missing the point of a six-year-old coming in from, an alien, from, from somewhere else who's suddenly faced with a whole new environment is going to feel threatened by the fact that the environment she knows it doesn't exist anymore. So one way of managing that is marking her territory around who she is the group around her and so on, and who she is not, which is my daughter in that case. So in some ways, in following the party line, the, the, the nursery, they've missed the point in my view. Now, instead of actually um, allowing my daughter to walk for the next several years with this sort of internalized sense of shame around her hair and her skin color, one of the things I took it upon myself to do was to actually, first of all, do a bit of research around hair, black hair um, in particular, because for you know, for those who probably don't know, black hair for black women is a massive factor in their identity, and is something which has been denigrated and put down for generations, dating going all the way back through slavery. In fact, what used to happen during slavery was um, the wives of slave owners, in order to prevent their uh, partners, their husbands, from being tempted by the female slaves, wanted petitioned their, their partners to actually have a law passed whereby black women's hair was bound up and hidden away in some way. So they couldn't have these sort of luscious trails rolling down, whatever or, or whatever it was, because that would tempt their men. It's a very sort of patriarchal idea rooted very much in the, in the idea of empathy. Look it up for those who don't understand what it means. Um, and what I realized for myself was I needed to do something as a black man to understand, to help my daughter reintegrate her love of her hair, to take away the shame of that. And there was a wonderful film called Hair Love, which was on, uh, which you can find on YouTube. It won an Oscar in 2019, I think it was, or 2020, something like that, for Best Short Film, which tells the story of a, of a, of a father of colour doing his daughter's hair before going off to see their mother who's in hospital or something like that. And myself and my daughter watched this movie, we loved it so much that we decided or I decided, and she agreed, because she was three or three and a half at the time, um, that we would spend time whenever she was with me doing hair. So every Sunday that she's with me, we sit down and we put on a film. It could be something by Disney or something else. We don't really care. And we'll sit there and we will do hair. And we yeah, we even, we, we do it to this day. She's now, what, she's now seven years old. And we still sit and we do hair on a regular basis. She's getting a bit older. She starts to do her own hair, but she loves it. Um, and she's very proud of her hair a lot more now, which sort of takes so it takes away from the shame, the internalized shame. I'm also very keen that she has um that we do enough things for her which sort of affirm her black identity. 
uh, for example, yeah, we're recording in November and um, it was Black History Month in, in October. And we'll often go out and do one or two things around Black history and so on. We'll go to events and festivals so that she can just be around other persons of colour um, enjoying either African dance or, or tutorials on, on or storytelling, whatever it is, or black stories, whatever it might be that she feels uh, or that we feel she might like to do. So there's something about recognising my role as her, as her father, as her parent, um, in affirming those parts of her racialized identity. So they're, they're not, uh, she doesn't have to hide them away in any way, out of shame or whatever it is. Well, I think it's I think it's a beautiful thing that you did, and you should really be commended for it. You know, so um, thank you. Thanks. Just want to say that. Uh, so I, I think that kind of leads me well into the next question. You know, um, we it's very easy for us to other ourselves so, so that we can the way we fit into society and stuff. And could you maybe tell mm. us about the the consequences of doing that? You know, what happens oh, when we course. do other ourselves? Yeah, of course. I, yeah, of course. It's such a tricky one. You know, Jacques Lacan wrote about this form of self-othering um, back, in the, I mean, back in the 1960s, I think. It's a shame it wasn't picked up more then. But the whole idea then, therefore, being that in order to fit into an environment and to feel safe, what we often tend to do is we other ourselves. We, we, we make ourselves smaller in some way in order to, 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 to survive. Uh, the problem with that is it's, it's literally soul-destroying. Um, and whilst it might feel safe for a while, what, what often happens is, is that part of ourselves we put to one side, which goes into our unconscious ultimately, has nowhere to go. It will play itself out somewhere along the way. So, for example, as um, if I'm sitting, if I'm, if I'm, a, if I reduce myself down in order to not encourage the the annoyance or the projected sort of fire or anger of somebody else, then what often happens is is I'll make myself smaller. But in that inauthenticity, that anger comes in anyway. So you end up repeating the pattern regardless. There's that, that which is coming from the outside. But like I've also said, in doing it to oneself, there's a psychological cost to that. As a therapist, I know who I am when my clients project onto me. The vast majority of the planet are not in that position. So when they self-other, um, you're going to re recreate that which you already know in a way. Okay. So that sense of marginalization uh oppression whatever it might be that comes up interesting interesting and in your doctor research you did those 25 interviews yeah. there's one the one you mentioned i've heard you say before about there was a there was a gay man you interviewed and he had to reject a lot of the feminine aspects of his personality mm. from a young age and that that manifested mm. in a really mm. destructive way can you tell us about that yeah sure he, he, what happened for, for, for him his name was, was Carl. Um, well, that was the name I used in, in my doctoral research. What used to happen for him, because he was, he was marginalised for being seen as overly feminine by his peers at school, what he would do is he would go into the, into the library with a pad and a paper, a pad and some paper, and just draw female figures over and over again. And, but each time he finished one, he'd be quite he, he finished one, he would tear out the paper and throw it away and then start a whole new one. So I think what this is the other part, we, you know, moving beyond shame, what actually gets activated when one when, when self-others or when it's othered, is that is the the death drive that drive to destroy that which is which sits down deep within us and makes us unique because it's not seen as acceptable by society. In a way, he, it, it, because he seemed to become internalized, he didn't really need after all, he didn't need the group to do anything at all. It became sort of self perpetuating. There was no one around that to say it's okay. Who you who you are is perfectly fine. There was no one there to normalize it. This death drive just starts to act itself out over and over again. And I gave you the example of colorism, that idea that we kill off or try and destroy that which makes us, mar which marks us out, there's a better way of putting it, as the racialized other, is part of that sort of death drive being activated, coming alive in, in some way. And I know with it, when I worked with Carl, one of the images that he drew for me um, was an image of a woman on the banks of the river Styx, waiting for literally for death to come and take her away to the underworld. So that sense of, I'm going to remove this part of myself and shove it into the unconscious and hopefully it, will, it won't come out. The problem with that is he kept going back to draw more and more. So you can't peel off the unkillable. It's always going to reside there if we want to come out at some point. Sometimes we can try and live a life where we do this in secret, whatever it might be, or we try and hide it away, or we do our, the best we can do. But these parts are always going to be alive within us and want to be known and seen. 
That's so interesting. And obviously it links well with, you know, Jung's concept of the shadow. It's yeah. Yeah. Um, and if we fail to reintegrate these parts of ourselves, they can become uh, almost aggressive almost. And yeah. do you, have yeah. you thought in any way about things like dissociation? You know, if the, if you're, is there any, any link there, do you think? Well, I think with any of the defenses that the psychological defenses, these can be ways of actually managing that split off part of one's own um, identity, shadow, if you like. So yeah, dissociation could be one way of doing it. Um, reactive formation could be another one. Um, repression is a, a huge one. I think one of the more interesting ones I'm finding in just doing some research is actually displacement, where in, in whatever we, we've repressed, upon ourselves, repressed of ourselves, gets cast out, projected onto a whole different grouping. That makes sense. Something I didn't, really, I didn't talk about in, 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 in the presentation. It's something I've been thinking about an awful lot. Because what actually happens then is we get to attack that other entity for being what we don't want to be. Makes sense? Now, are you talking about a whole cultural group here or just another individual? Both. I think individuals can do it. But that's something that Marie-Louise von Franz writes about in the book, Projection and Recollection, is whole groups can do it too. A collective group can actually take their collective shadow and cast it out onto a whole different group. And if that group is not careful, then they will end up acting out said shadow um, and playing it out. And therefore, the, you know, the controlling group, if you like, or the subject group, gets to say, well, see, there, there we go. I told you that group was, was more emotional, angry, whatever it might be, all those sorts of things. So whole groups can do this. This is where we, end, we move towards more that sort of political side, side of things. And that can be manipulated in a way. So that the idea of, well, if you, um, if you allow this group into said country, whatever it is, then this is what's going to happen, all that sort of thing. But, and actually what often happens is totally the opposite. They're actually perfectly fine. But there's something built into the fear of another, which is actually our other. It's not to do with anything out, out there. 100%. Uh, so... There is something to the idea then that that which most annoys us about other people yeah. is something that we have rejected within ourselves yep. and haven't yep. integrated. Okay. A very, a very uh, Jungian idea. Yeah. But I think he's quite right in that respect. And th this is probably a good place to bring in dream, dream work as well. You know, um, mm -hmm. dreams can, you think dreams can show us parts of ourselves that we have, we might have rejected or um, othered and yeah, that, that can show up in dreams in some way. Totally. Because I think the one of the things about the unconscious is, and this is the you correct Carl's Carl's point, Carl's example earlier on, we might we might try and repress and kill off these parts. But it's a it's a it's not a real death, excuse me. It's it's it, we're, we're just repressing something which which symbolically will come to the surface when it's the appropriate time to do so. And dream work is often about um the un the unconscious trying to repair. What's the phrase? A hypertrophy sense of self. That makes sense. So something which is which has become reduced in some way. It's trying to repair itself. It's it's you know we're trying to we're trying to grow all the time. And dream work can be a great way of re of, of exploring and recognizing whatever it is that we have to put to one side in order and that that needs to be reintegrated and re-known of ourselves. I know in um in my in my book and also um in uh on, in the talk that whole idea of dream work being um, using alchemy and dream work and going into the unconscious to actually understand through the use of alchemy and, and that sort of process, just what it is within the unconscious wants to be known, how painful it is to actually have to break down to get to know it alongside actually what it's like to then start to reintegrate these parts of ourselves in order to then bring them back out into the world. That makes sense. So I know for my own sort of dream journey, if you like, um, yeah. One of the things I used to put down an awful lot was, you know, I didn't really bring much of my, my cultural identity to my training when I was training way back when. That would often play itself out in, in the dreamscape, whereby there was often a sense of trying to kill off my own sense of blackness in my unconscious. What used to happen, especially when I was doing my doctoral research, was recognize, I started to recognize that actually that part is a part of it. I just needed to start to reintegrate it. Mm -hmm. So I took risks. It was, you know, I took risks at not self-othering. I'll use that, use that sort of phrase. By bringing in more of my cultural identity to, look, to the work that I do, to the writing that I do, my presentations and how I present, um, being more myself and, 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 so, and so on. So I don't, actually presentation is a very good idea, a very good example. I don't present in a way which is 
traditionally academic, whatever that means, but I do try and make it my own, whatever I do, because it's more real, it's more true to myself. And people relate to that a lot more. People often pick up if you're just playing a role. You certainly, you certainly do. And you know, you, you're not, you, you get them from, when I'm speaking to you, you're not hiding anything. You're fully yourself. You're fully, you know, you're fully embodying who you are. And I, mm. I think there's so much freedom in that, you know, mm. and mm. totally, that is maybe the best way to live, you know? And I wonder, is that available to most people if they do embrace a certain way of, way of being? Um, yeah, I think it is, ultimately, if we're able to do the work on and rediscovering these aspects of our of our identities. It's not, you know, I'm, I'm talking much, so much about the socially constructed ones, which I think are quite, quite plentiful. If we can start to access those, then we get to be more true to ourselves. We're not so defined by a culture that wants us to be a certain way and to play a certain, you know, act a certain way and to speak in a certain language, all these sorts of things. There's enough to make us conform as it is without us having to do it all ourselves, to, to ourselves as well. Yeah. Now, something that came to mind whenever we were talking about dreams there, I had a dream a few months ago. I was at my high school and somebody, I was having a fight with a, a bully. Now, I haven't seen this guy in about 15 years, but he was the most aggressive, like nasty person in our year. He was a real bully. like, And I was in a mm. fight with this guy. Mm. And the, the next few days I was thinking about that. And I was like, that, that person is has been internalized in my psyche that's like an, mm. arch an archetype of a bully yep. and maybe, maybe that's yep. something that i that i haven't dealt with in my own personality or, or something so oh. could you maybe tell us about how we internalize melanie klein's work about internalizing objects and why, why there might mm -hmm. be a might be a link here Mm. I think you're, you're making a very good point. So many clients' ideas about objects, you know, we, we, we relate to different objects around them. We take them in, we, we imbibe them. So any experience that we ever have forms a part of our sort of internalized um, family system or cultures and whatever, whatever is what you want to use around it. I think one of the wonderful things about many clients' work, one of the things that gets misunderstood is these internalizations are not always positive. Um, you know, it's like your mother and your father, whatever else. If something as negative as that it becomes internalized, it can play itself out unconsciously. So that part of ourselves that well, doesn't want to be seen as a bully will will bring in okay an image of something we didn't like when we were children and, and so on. So and that it will that will play itself out. But the thing about the internalization is they are all parts of ourselves. So I know when I've had these sorts of dreams come, come up, every aspect of myself is that dream. Even in Carl's example earlier on, he is both woman on the, on the backs of the sticks but also death, that make, if that makes sense. So in your particular dream, you are both yourself, but also the bully. And only by actually um, recognizing and having these two start to relate to each other, can we actually repair the, repair, repair the split in, in our psyche, if that, if that makes sense, so that something else can come through. Because ultimately, that bully is in pain in their own way, one could suggest. And what is it that bully's got to, got to say about ourselves? Um, if I was playing with an idea and I don't know you that well, so I can't I, I talk to myself. But if, if, I, if I was having that sort of dream, then what part of myself, what part of my aggression and my fire and my dynamism am I repressing? That's where I would go if I was myself. I know what I'm, I'm like. Um, so it's what qualities that person still has. So you're quite right. It's still archetypal, but maybe it can be used and transformed in some way. Really interesting. Okay. So uh, in terms of helping people maybe to reintegrate parts of themselves that they might have othered what would you say in the, in the work that you do are some of the most effective ways you find to, to help with that process sure i think if we're, if we're doing it on ourselves i think journaling over a period of time and looking at when you know when when are we the other actually helps us to start to actually just go into that sort of deeper space of understanding so journaling can be a great way of doing that also monitoring one's dreams and asking for dreams to come up which actually represent our experiences out in the world, they'll be there amongst every other type of dream. They'll, they'll still be there in, in, in their own way. And start to understand the symbolism that goes with the dreams and recognize that these are all parts of ourselves. Um, what I found when I, you know, another part of my, my doctoral research was I did six months of heuristic work, uh, Clark Moustakis writes about this, where I actually explored my own experience of being an outsider. And what I realized was that over time, this, in, in staying with that, things started to repair themselves even though it was painful to do so. That makes sense. Because change is not an easy thing. 
individuation is uneasy because often pictures are, oh, we're just going to change and grow and it's all going to be nice and fluffy and whatever else. Actually, it's really painful and quite horrific, which is why lots of people don't do it. Um, and it's shadow, it's deep shadow work, what we're sort of talking about. So the more that one's comfortable with that, the better. Therapy is another way of looking at it with therapists who understand social constructionism and also family systems. I think that's another way of, 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 of exploring it as well. Um, Creative work with sand play, um, where we actually externalize some of these internalized objects in creative means in a tray of sand, so we can see just what we are, uh, what we what we've been left with from our childhoods in our developmental stages. So those are just some of the ways I would recommend to actually look to go down this sort of route. Awesome, awesome. Well, um, Dr. Turner, we've only got a few minutes left because I know you've got a client now coming up very shortly. Um, so just a, a couple of quick questions to finish up. Um, well, the first, the first is about you know, your own work, if people want to learn more about um, just the, the incredible work you're putting out into the world, where can they where can they get the book? Where can they find you online? How can they connect with you? Sure. Uh, the book is available through Routledge. Um, so if you go to the Routledge website, you can always get it there. It's available, it's available through on, on Amazon as well. They sell it on, on, on Amazon, although you may want to, I'm not going to get it too harsh on Jeff Bezos. Otherwise I'll start ranting. Um, but if you buy you can buy it any, anywhere. And actually other bookstores will either order it in or they or they have it in stock for yourself as well. So it's it's widely available. Uh, if you want to contact me, you can either do so through my website, which is dwightonercounseling.co.uk. That's dwightonercounseling.co.uk. I'm also bizarrely active on uh, social media. And probably the best route for that is either through Twitter, where my handle is at dturner 300 so that's at Detail 300 on Twitter, where I'm always posting about stuff. If it's not my morning run along the beach here at, uh, in Eastbourne, there's something to do with social uh, justice and stuff like that. Or um, on LinkedIn, where if you just you know, find my name, Dwight, Dr. Dwight Turner, you, yeah, you can always connect with me that way around as well. Or Facebook, I've got a Dwight Turner counseling page there. So I'm always all over the place, blimey, always doing something. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And the, the three books you'd recommend that every therapist should uh, should read? Sure, sure. Um, I'm going to go for, for, let's start with my own book, In Sections of Privilege and Otherness in Counseling and Psychotherapy. Let's go with that one. Um, I'm going to go with an, a, a newish one, I think, really, because I think, um, probably haven't mentioned this, there's a great book which has come out called Qu Queering Psychotherapy, which is edited by, I need to read out the name here, uh, Jane Sigileska. C Z Y Z S E L S K A. Uh, their name is Chance. Their middle name is Chance. Now it's Queering Psychotherapy, which I think is a great book um, in itself. It's only recently come out. And the last one is uh, Black Identities, White Therapies, as edited by Colin Largo and Divine Chowra. Uh, and I think that one's I think it's through PCCS books. Queering Psychotherapies by is is through Carnac. Yeah, we've actually got Divine and uh, Colin. They're going to be presenting the summit as well. So. Oh, cool. Good, good. <laughs> good people. Um, but anyway, Dr. Turner, I know you've got to go for your client. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you and prepare for this interview. I've loved every moment. And I just want to wish you all the best going forward. And I hope we're able to work together in the not too distant future as well. All right. I look forward, absolutely look forward to it. All the best to yourselves as well. So absolute pleasure as always. Take care of yourself, sir. All right. Speak soon. Take care. Bye-bye.